Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to another At America TV event with me, Jasmine. I hope you all are doing well. So for those of you joining us for the first time, At America is the U.S. Embassy's American Center, and our mission is to provide a space for young Indonesians to learn more about the United States. We have temporarily moved to a digital platform so you can still enjoy all of our events at home. So tonight we will be discussing U.S. Independence Day Orchestra for the Nation. But before we begin, I would like to share with you that Ad America is having a giveaway. As part of our 10th anniversary celebration and also celebrating 4th of July, we're inviting you to participate so you don't miss out on a chance to receive a content creator package. Now, for those of you who don't want to miss out on that, stay tuned until the end of the program because that's when I'll be sharing with you how to join. And also before we begin, I would like to share with you our social media quiz question for this evening. So tonight's question is, in what year did the Star Spangled Banner officially became the U.S. National Anthem? Is it A, 1776, B, 1812, C, 1931, or D, 1945? So in what year did the Star Spangled Banner officially became the U.S. National Anthem? You can participate in our social media quiz by commenting on our social media platform on our Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, or Instagram. And for those of you who got the answer correctly, you will get a live shout out from us at the end of the program. All right, before we begin tonight's event, I would like to invite for the opening remarks, Ibu Deidra Evanazora, Acting Cultural Affairs Attaché and Ad America Director. Salamat Malam. Hello, my name is Deidre Avendasora. As the Ad America Director and Acting Cultural Attaché at the U.S. Embassy in Jakarta, it is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event. Tonight's special guests are Robert Nordling, Artistic Director of Bandung Philharmonic and Fulbright alum, Michael Hall, Co-Artistic Director of Bandung Philharmonic, Stacy Garup, Freelance Composer, and moderator, Irene Efrin, founder of Bandung Philharmonic. A warm welcome to all of our guests and to everyone who is joining us online from your home, your work, or wherever you may be. This month, we celebrate the 245th anniversary of the independence of the United States of America. We hope you enjoy celebrating with us as the Bandung Philharmonic plays American patriotic songs and classical music from our two countries. Americans usually commemorate their national day with fireworks, parades, baseball games, concerts, and eating delicious barbecue with our families. Many of you have joined us here at Ad America in the past to share the joy of this anniversary with us. Sadly, we cannot be together to celebrate this year. We have all faced so much adversity since the first COVID-19 cases were identified in the United States and Indonesia. The COVID-19 crisis has taken its toll on all of us. I can't think of anyone among us here today who hasn't lost a loved one, a friend, or a colleague. And Indonesia continues to experience the hardship of this crisis. Many of you have supported your communities during the pandemic ensuring your neighbors and colleagues' safety, security, and well-being. We thank you for all that you do. Please know that the United States will continue to support Indonesia's vaccination efforts to help save lives. From the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the U.S. government has worked with Indonesia, helping to equip health workers with the tools needed, improving laboratory, disease surveillance, and rapid response capacity accelerating case detection and tracking, and enhancing risk communications to ensure more people know how to protect themselves and others. In April 2021, the United States announced additional funding of $3.5 million 
to boost Indonesia's vaccination efforts, bringing the total U.S. government support for Indonesia's COVID-19 response to $14.5 million. While we all still have a long way to go to fight this virus, we should not lose hope. Let's be there for one another, taking care of one another. And tonight, let's allow music to heal and unite us. Thank you again for joining us this evening. I hope you enjoy the performance and discussion. Thank you so much, Ibu Deidre, for the warm welcome. And now to begin tonight's event, I would like to invite our moderator for this evening, Ibu Irin Efrian, co-founder of Bandung Philharmonic. The $10 founding father without a father got a lot farther by working a lot harder, by being a lot smarter, by being a self-starter by 14. Oops, that was from last year's 4th of July celebrations with Hamilton Musical. Sorry, but this year you're with me, Irene Efren, my colleagues from the Bandung Philharmonic, Maestro Robert Nordling, Michael Hall, and composer Stacey Garup with a really fantastic program. We are going to begin with Krakatoa, a viol viola concerto that was premiered by the Bandung Philharmonic at the Hilton Bandung in January, 2018. The Bandung Philharmonic is a professional symphony orchestra that I founded together with my colleagues. And since the founding of the orchestra in 2016, we've had numerous world premieres, live concerts, various programs, including the Tunas Bandung Philharmonic, which is a community outreach program to underprivileged communities. Every day, we provide them free orchestral music education because we believe that every child deserves to learn music. You can follow Bandung Philharmonic's programs and also support what we do via our social media channels, Instagram, Twitter, our website, and also on our Facebook. Without further ado, I would like to invite the video of Krakatoa.
Doesn't that just transport you back? Bravo again, bravo again, Michael, Robert, and Stacy. It's I great to listened. watch again. It is. I haven't listened to that recording in so long. It was it was like hearing it absolutely brand new. I fantastic. Bravo, Michael. I forgot how how powerful the ending was. Yeah, it has it has sort of powerful experiences and moments, very different kinds of power throughout it. You know, there's these massive buildup of forces, you know, those four big eruptions, but then there's the there's the intimacy of the cadenza, and then of course that ending that just transports us to a whole different world, different way of thinking, a different way of being. It's, uh, yeah, it's a marvelous, marvelous experience. If I can throw in that whole idea for the ending, um, the circular bowing is something that Michael suggested. He, he actually brought up in a session that he did with my students at Roosevelt University when I used to teach there. And uh, without that, that's, that airy, that beautiful airy sound wouldn't mm -hmm. exist in the piece. So I think one of the themes for me about talking about Krakatoa is collaboration. That so much of this is you know us learning from each other and delving yeah. into the material and finding out what we can do together that we wouldn't be able to do by ourselves. Yeah, that's the number one word I think on, on my notes to share too is how collaborative this was and the whole idea of collaborating with, with a composer and a soloist. An important process of giving a birth, it, you know, each one of us is carrying a different part of this forward, you know, the, 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 the manifestation of the piece, the, the the and then the joint carrying it and giving it birth into the world and the process that we all share in that is is very exciting mm -hmm. and you're right watching this for the first time in a long time it's a <clears throat> um, first of all it feels like another another century ago oh, a different world <laughs> um a long time ago but yeah it's it's it also, it also reminded me of just how much um how much commitment that that uh, that Irene Efren and the entire Bandung Philharmonic Organization has towards bringing new music to Indonesia and the world, and not rare uh, for those of of uh, you watching this program who do not regularly attend orchestra concerts, it's not common to have a brand new piece of music performed. In fact, most often it's the case that you'll have pieces that have been played millions of times already but to have a living composer present a piece and be present at that premiere is an exceedingly rare occasion in today's world so uh, it was an absolute thrill to have stacy garrop on the other side of the planet with us joining us coming from chicago all the way to bandung for the premiere and the preparation and but Absolutely, Irene and the organization, just thank you so much for your strong commitment to bringing new music and and predominantly Indonesian composers uh, to the world. So it's it's an incredible platform for that community. So thank you. That's really true, Michael. I'm just going to jump in on that. I mean, in its short life, the Bandung Phil has commissioned and premiered 16 brand new works. Uh, committing to do a new piece on every single concert uh, we commission a piece so so yes i i echo that bravo to the organization for its commitment to uh to bring into life the next um group of great pieces you know that will that will yes. become thank you later. thank you that means a lot michael and robert thank you very much well it's that actually... collaborative process that you spoke about stacy it, it it actually has to be in the organizational and the administrative right. uh, uh, branch of any artistic organization as well for that to actually happen. So. And the audience as well, the audience eager to hear to hear what's new and what, what's going on. They play a big collaborative role in this too. Yeah, there are very few orchestras, even in the United States, that do this on a regular basis. Like the fact that you've got 16 premieres already is amazing. And given how short of a life, you know, when this orchestra began. Right. Uh, there's the one I can think of in the United States that's been dedicated the entire, uh, for the last, I don't know, 30 years or so is the Albany Symphony in New York. Um, and beyond that, I think people are programming a little bit here or there. 
I think with the pandemic, things may change. We've been mm -hmm. seeing a lot of movement in orchestras to finally start paying attention to mm -hmm. who's doing what and what our social issues are going on in this country and how right. can we bring this to the forefront of um, people's minds in concert halls. So we'll see what changes, but really you guys have done a tremendous job in supporting living composers. Thank you. Thank you also, Stacy. Talking about living composers and the whole process of collaboration, can you walk us through the process of how you compose this piece? Sure, I would be happy to. <laughs> um, this all began because um, when Michael and I were, and Robert, I remember we sat down to breakfast one morning um, in downtown Chicago, and we came up with this idea of applying for a Barlow Foundation grant. And we decided that string orchestra and percussion would be a good match with solo viola because our main concern was making sure that we don't overpower Michael. Um, but it wasn't until we got the Barlow grant that I was at a concert a few months later with Michael and he said, I have one word for you and it's volcanoes. And that was where um, I hadn't really thought about what's the subject matter gonna be. And I began researching volcanoes in Indonesia and the idea of Krakatoa, once I began researching Krakatoa, it's like, oh, this is, this is the right story that I wanna be telling. That's and, the volcano. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I know that you guys are very familiar with Krakatoa, um, but what I, what I drew from it, um, this is the, um, the eruption that happened in 1883, was just how mammoth it was. Uh, the fact that once it began erupting two months later, um, it had four massive explosions. And the fourth one was so big that it basically blew the top of that volcano off and everything uh, then sunk under the sea. Uh, the statistics are really what shocked me that the shock waves went into the atmosphere and circled the globe seven times and it triggered tsunamis that then flooded um, villages, uh, 165 coastal villages and killed lots of people. It propelled tons of ash 50 miles up into the atmosphere and the ash not only blotted out the sun in Indonesia for days, but it lowered global temperatures for several years afterward. And uh, even if I can share for one brief moment, um, a little screen share here. Uh, let me do this and then to this, oh no, sorry, to this. Um, I don't know how many of you know Edvard Munch's The Scream. You can see mm -hmm. it here on the right side. Um, that the atmosphere, if you look at it, uh, they, people have traced uh, the lineage of this to thinking that he saw, this is the ash from Krakatoa from the year that he saw it and where his location was and um, the color scheme that he saw in the sky and how that translated into anxiety for him. So that, that is fascinating to see just how far this, this went. Um, so after all of that, I thought about what is the story that I want to tell? And I came up with a three movement structure. The first one is called imminent. And that's where we saw at the beginning of the, of the uh, video, uh, you hear this sound at Michael, I'm wondering if you might be able to jo uh, jump in and demonstrate just a few things for us. The first one is that the, uh, the orchestra represents uh, Krakatoa waking up. So we hear two things in them. And the first one is what we call cold Daniel Batuto. And Michael, what does that sound like? <laughs> Thank you. And so when you get a whole section doing it, it's very percussive. And it shows the restlessness of the volcano as it's trying to wake up. And the other thing they do is that they start doing these glisses. So it's just a very short uh, G to F sharp gliss. Actually, this one is down. Go G to F sharp, just a half step down. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And that's the sound that we start hearing over and over again amid silences. And then that way that you can hear the volcano is trying to wake up, but it's not there yet. So, and then Michael is busy uh, being the soloist uh, on top of this, doing lots of wonderful material. Um, and then right before we get to the eruption, uh, Michael actually plays the eruption theme. So we get a little prelude, prelude of it. Um, and then we go into the full eruption sequence and we hear four eruptions over the course of that middle movement, each one getting bigger and bigger and bigger. 
um, when we get to the fourth and final eruption, um, it goes into an extended solo from Michael. This is his first cadenza. And he then helps to calm down the, the volcano um, and put it basically into a dormant series. And as part of this dormant series, uh, the, the orchestra is doing something that uh, Michael introduced me to, which is the circular or the cir cyclical, circular bowing. And Michael, can you please demonstrate what that sounds like? Yeah, most of us are who are familiar with string instruments are very familiar with the idea of the bow moving up and down, back and forth across the string. But circular bowing um, is a very different ge geometry. And as a result, it gets more than one note. You'll hear sliding and glistening and also the sound of the bow just scraping against the string. So you get a composite sound. Instead of this, you get... So it's, it's a wonderful kind of palette that, uh, that creates a little bit of mystery and it's a softer hue, kind of a watery, colory sound. And it's very fun to play, quite honestly. <laughs> Thank you for demonstrating. And so you get a little taste of that earlier. And at the end of the piece, you hear the whole upper, all the upper strings are actually mm -hmm. playing chords using this, this mm -hmm. secular bowing. So that's when you get this very airy sound. And if you saw in the video, you see a lot of people's bows doing exactly what we just saw with Michael. It looks a little bizarre on stage, but it makes this beautiful effect. So basically when we get to um, this third movement called dormant, um, this is where I, I thought back to my own um, college days and I was part of a Javanese gamelan for um, a while. And um, I learned all about the tuning systems of Slendro and Pelog and um, played all the different uh, gradations of gongs. And what I wanted to put into this final section was basically a westernized version of the Pelog scale. So I used that as well as the cyclical nature of the way that we, um, gamelan is structured. Mm -hmm. And also the other thing I took from gamelan is that um, the biggest gongs go off the least often. So we have uh, the largest gong only going off once per cycle at the end of the cycle and the smaller gongs, you know, depending on size thing, um, happen more and more frequently. So that, those are the things that I put into that third movement um, but you hear there is a good amount of energy that still builds up and I feel like it's the volcano trying to come up a little bit awake again, but then Michael plays another cadenza and, and eases it back into a nice slumber. And that's where Krakatoa stayed until we know it began to resurface in the 1920s and then Anak Krakatoa has been um, having its own eruption since then. So that's the basic idea behind it. I, I came up with the structure first and then decided what kind of effects might help represent the, the sound of the volcano itself, as well as Michael then having his role and commenting upon it or urging people to get out of the way, et cetera. It's like I see a movie in my head and then I'm just orchestrating to that movie. I was just about to say something along that lines. Uh, you spoke very clearly about the architecture and the, the pieces that create that in a technical format, but really from uh, from just a, an outsider's of observation it's just like watching a movie you are telling a very clear story of the awakening and the cosmic event and then that closure and it's this wonderful art and it's so cinematic and, and that's something that I everybody out there listening right now run after this event and search out Stacy Garrup uh, composer and find all of her other music because what you will discover a large portion, I think almost everything I've ever heard you write, is extremely um, uh, wrapped around the concept of storytelling. And you can, feel, even if you don't know the story or if you don't know the title, you can almost guess. I mean, you can, in most cases, very clearly guess what the story is about. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's just wonderful drama in your music. Well, and thank you. This piece yeah. really shows that too. Well, I think it really comes from um, the very first production I ever saw when I was probably six or seven years old was West Side Story. Um, my parents took me to see it. And the first time Tony opened up his mouth and saying something's coming, that's when I was, I was like, oh my goodness. And then, you know, the whole storyline. 
Um, I think it was a combination of that. And quite frankly, this is a very nerdy thing to say, but the music theory books that we used in my undergraduate days um, were very uh, form-based. It, it's something mm. that's called Schenkerian analysis. That was the basis of it. And I didn't know that at the time, but everything is really about tension and relaxation. And so part of me has always wondered if I had gone to a different university that used a different set of theory books, how would I be thinking about music at this point? I don't know. But here we are, and I love what I'm doing. <laughs> From womb to tomb. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I forgot what the response is to that line. <laughs> um, actually, I can't remember also, but it's, it's Tony's line. <laughs> I know oh. there'll be. I think there's a movie version, uh, new movie version coming out soon of West Side Story. Yep, we yep, are very, very excited. Oh, speaking of, um, you know, you and Michael were going off about uh, about the storytelling. I wanted to ask Michael, what is your favorite part about composing this concerto? About performing it, because uh, I, mm -hmm. yeah, bringing uh, it to life. Uh, you know, it's it's the contrast. It's, it's not one feature, it's the fact that there is a sequence that goes back and forth of the incredible high octane energy and then the absolute vulnerability and openness. And to be able to swing back and forth is quite, quite a joy because there are a lot of pieces uh, that I play which will be either overtly sad throughout or there'll be really strong and but they don't offer the the breadth of e emotional experiences and quite honestly it's a joy to play a piece that has all of that in it because well first of all it it helps me physically because the piece if you notice is one continuous long journey uh there are no breaks so the moments that i get to actually just musically physically save me a little bit as well but it, it it gives me the energy then to recharge and then take off again with another big explosive event or and that can be either cataclysmic and high octane kineticism in other words fast and loud or it can be the high energy really required to make an emotional statement that is like a giant sunburst just it takes actually maybe more energy to do that in a slow piece of music than the fast. So, um, you know, when when Stacy wrote this, I think one of the other things I asked, and the reason I said volcano was, please, no slow sad songs all the way throughout, right? Because energy. And when I first started practicing this, I quickly realized that it just had this almost like a Greek tragedy aspect to it where you're you're falling in love with the characters and you're experiencing what the people uh being well yeah the, when the volcano was erupting just what the people are experiencing rather and that's me what the viola solo part during the loud explosions i'm the people running around scattering trying to escape the volcano while the volcano is the orchestra, you know, trying to chase me. And then the exhale of relief afterwards. So I think more than anything, uh, the whole joy of playing this piece and getting it from Stacey is the fact that she gave me an all violas of a piece of music that offers an incredible and an endless supply of emotional expression because there's so many different ways to play this. That was what you just heard is one. Uh, it can be played far more uh, now that the very first performance, so now that's had years of reflection and experience and looking back, it can, there can be even more traumatic and more forceful in the middle, or it can be, you know, laid back and drawn out. Lots of ways to go with, with this. Um, so I think that's the really the thing that I'd like to say to Stacey is thank you for giving us a vehicle that is just so wide for possibilities of expression. Um, and also for physically giving us chances to breathe and pounce, breathe and pounce. Well, I have to thank you for that too. I don't know, Michael, if you remember the earlier version of this, but you were playing just about nonstop. And we discovered that there were parts where that wasn't necessary. The orchestra was taking care of generating the energy 
for you. So we, I think even up to the day before the premiere, we actually pulled out a few more spots from your, your music. And then we were like, oh, this gives you such a nice chance to breathe and regroup. And it really just really saved the piece, I think in some ways for everybody's chops in the long run. So thank you for that, <laughs> for that insight. Um, but that's really, I think, why everything, every stage of composing is a collaboration from the initial talks about what might the idea be to what things are going to fit Michael's hands so that this sounds completely natural to him, to what can we do to save uh, people's hands and, um, uh, you know, as they go through the piece, how can we make their lives easier? I've been writing opera now. It's the same thing. You don't want a singer singing all two hours of an opera. They're gonna, you need to take care of their voice and make sure that you help them get ready for this marathon. And I feel like Michael's the same thing. It's, you're playing a marathon. So where can we give you a couple pit stops along the way? It, it, it is very much like in athletics. You can't rely on only one person on the team to carry the entire team. Yeah, yeah. so it's sharing the ball, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Not just for physical endurance, it's also, I imagine, um, you also contemplate the fact that for the audience's perspective, they need to see that contrast a lot more and the change in colors and the passing visually along the stage, right? That and I think too, just being able to pay attention to some of the colors going on behind you. So like, especially when we get to that third movement and we start to hear gongs and things going off, uh, we need some space around you to hear that and really take in those colors. So I think everything is a balancing act. And yours was the very first concerto I did. I wrote another concerto right on its heels called Quicksilver for saxophone and wind ensemble. And by then I began to figure out, oh, I need a few more breaks along the way. And that's why when we went back and put in breaks for yours, it's like, oh, of course I should have done that in the first place. But you know, you grow and you learn with each experience. And you know, I would have played all of it anyway, but, but thank <laughs> you for the breathers. <laughs> Yeah, it was, talking it was, about, sorry, if, if I may comment, talking about uh, concerto, and I would also like to invite our conductor, <laughs> the colors behind <laughs> Robert Nordling. Um, can you, just in case, you know, there's people tuning in that don't know the difference between a concerto and this piece is very special. There's Michael, the violist, and there's an orchestra. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? And, you know, what? how do you handle that difference of conducting two different types of works? Yeah. Well, I'm gonna I, 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 I'm gonna make a comment and then answer your question. You know, th there's actually pro there's more that's the same than there is that's different. There's more the same between working with a piece with a solo and an ensemble, and then just working with say a, a, a symphony. Is your task is to understand the music through study and analysis, find out what's going on, what were the composer's intentions. That's the conductor's job, is to try and crawl into the head and heart of the composer. What, did the com what were the composer's ideas musically? What were the composer's ideas emotionally, spiritually, narratively? This, this piece has a story. Is there a story this composer is, is, is touching and reaching out? Uh, socially, politically, what, what were the composer's intentions? That happens no matter what, uh, no matter what's going on. And then, of course, ultimately, the conductor's job is to get a group of people to work together to make a performance, to make these, to, to present the ideas of the composer as faithfully as possible. Now, that said, obviously, there are going to be some differences. And you've heard a little bit um, with Michael and Stacy's comments about this collaborative part. All orchestral playing is collaborative, right? It's 80 people or however many people collaborating together thinking, not doing the same thing, doing all different things, but bringing their different thing to make one thing, you know? Um, but when working with a concerto, there's a special partnership. There's a, there's a the, the, the level of collaboration goes up substantially. Uh, and, you know, Michael has been a good friend for many years. We actually lived in the same building across the hall from each other. So that collaboration was easy. I would be going through the score and running something, go bang on his door and say, what do you think about this? What should we do here? Um, but the, the soloist of a concerto or the soloist of this piece or whatever also knows this piece intimately and will have ideas about what the composer wanted and suggestions about, about, uh, about what, how it should go. 
the conductor also behaves as an accompanist here. If you think about concerts where you've seen like a singer and a pianist, where the pianist is very much active in making the music, but as an accompanist, and in this sense, the, 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 the conductor and the orchestra are accompanying. Um, and that's a great, that's a particular joy to do for me is to, is to help a soloist to shine, help a soloist create a musical atmosphere, create a musical place, a spiritual, emotional place on stage where the soloist can absolutely bring everything that they've prepared to it. So those are just a few things that, uh, that come to mind, both some similarities and I think some, I think some differences about specifically the difference between uh, uh, solo concerto work and sort of say or, uh, orchestral works. Robert, I'm wondering um, for, for those watching, like I mentioned earlier, who haven't gone to many orchestra concerts in their, in their life, What's it like to stand on the podium in, in front of an orchestra? What's that experience like? Because it looks yeah. like you've got the best seat in the house. Well, yeah. I mean, I've been doing this now almost for 50 years, like 45 years, and I'm still overwhelmed by the sound of, of an orchestra standing there. It's completely different than the best sound system you can imagine. This is 80 sound sources happening at once. Everybody doing something different. The thing that makes orchestras extraordinary is not sameness or unity. The thing that makes it is diversity, is the idea that there are many, many things happening that are in totally different that combine together. So sonically, sound-wise, it's a huge experience. Relationally, communally, orchestral playing is a communal experience. There's a playing for the other. There's a taking the concerns of the other and making them my concerns. Um, and ultimately, of course, all of us within the orchestra, the other is the composer. How can we crawl inside the head of the composer with this code called printed music? How do we decipher? How do we decipher the code? So yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Michael. And I know you've experienced it your whole life as well. As Stan. I mean, you play a lot of music unaccompanied. What difference is it for you when you're standing and playing something by yourself as opposed to standing in front of a whole ensemble and playing? Oh, that's interesting. Um, you know, it, when I when I do play pieces that are written for just solo viola, and I'm standing in a hall of, you know, like 2000 people, and I'm the only person on stage, believe it or not, I actually, I hear the room. Mm. And you feel like you're having a conversation with the room and the yes. people in the room. If and, it's a good room. <laughs> yeah. And in, in that respect, you know, it's it sometimes it's very frightening, but it's also incredibly liberating, mm. just in the sense that you know that you're responsible for having your share of the conversation, and the more people you add to that, it becomes more intricate, of course, but more beautiful. That's why it's so that intricacy is quite honestly when you're playing with an orchestra, is one of the more more sophisticated social engagements you could ever have as a human yeah. being. Yeah. Because you're all in this kind of similar mind frame, yet doing your specialized techniques to play a trumpet versus a viola versus a glockenspiel and, and percussion, yet still take all of that specialized technique that has been accumulated over, for each person, probably tens yeah. of years of studies. And centuries of developing each of those instruments, you Absolutely. know? Absolutely. And then, yeah. to, like you were saying earlier, to come to a consensus which is your job. Every one of the ones on stage has their own idea of how they think it should be, but you kind of channel and funnel and say, for this moment, we're going to do it this way. Because we think that's what the composer had in mind. Yeah. <laughs> and, and when I play and on by heart. myself, and when, I, when I'm performing solo just by myself, I have to be the conductor. I have to be, at right. times, not just the one person speaking, but actually talking back to myself with the musical dialogue. So there's always, I always feel like even when I'm playing by myself, I think of it as a, an ensemble. Uh, That's good. Yep, um, That's good. 
but but it's it's like standing in next to you while you're conducting i have to say that was one of the more um comforting feelings i've ever had on stage because there's like you have you had my back and every time i've ever seen you conduct a soloist singer uh instrumentalist it doesn't matter you are so gracious in in terms of supporting because part of the job of the conductor is not just making certain the orchestra is doing right but it's also making certain that the soloist says oh yeah now is when you come in mm. or maybe you know hold on just a little bit and you do it so gracefully well that thank you that's very kind i mean power. i have nothing but ultimate respect for the soloist who walks out and puts themselves on the line. And so anything this ensemble can do to make your job easier, and not just easier, but to make your contribution to this event, everything it can be, then it, then we've been successful, you know. So. Can I jump in with one more Please. comment? And that's that um, while the composer might Put the music on paper it's collaborative even to the point where i i put the notes on paper and then i want the conductor the soloist and the orchestra to add their interpretation onto those notes right. so i think a composer takes a score to a certain point and then they trust everybody from that point on yeah. and that is i think the essence of collaboration yeah that's very true i mean uh, one of the joys of this particular commission, Stacy, was um, having you there. You know, uh, when when we prepare a piece of music, we have the code, we have the score most of the time. And we have to find from this printed page, gosh, what did she mean when she wrote Forte, which simply means loud and having to make all kinds of decisions. With you there, it was brilliant. Because uh, um, folks, Stacy was there for all the rehearsals. We were there in conversation beforehand, and then at the rehearsals and of course at the performance. And we could practice it, play it, turn around, and then turn around into a darkened hall to Stacy and say, what did you think? Was that too much? And she would say, no, it was great. Or no, 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 no. Let's drop this. Let's change these dynamics. So it was a, it was a, uh, made it much, much easier to really understand what you are after. Uh, but there is a fine line in there. Like I'm, I'm there to help make sure the piece is functioning well and that the interpretation is more or less in agreement with what I have. But then from there, I want to see what you bring to the piece. And quite often I'll take things that I hear in performance and say, oh, they did something interesting there. I've got to put that into the score. So I think it that's what I mean by collaborative. Like yes. we, we need to make sure that the piece is functioning in the way that it's going to make the proportions work. But then after that, it's all about what you guys want to do with it. And there's all kinds of horror stories about, <laughs> try, Michael, you know a bunch of these about composers and performers and fussing at each other, but we didn't experience any of those horror stories. Everybody was trying to outdo one another in, in gracious collaboration. So it, well, it, was, it was a priceless experience having you there because really the first performance no matter how, I, I, I think I practiced, you know, dedicated eight months to only practicing Krakatoa before performing it. And you think you have an idea of what the piece is about. And you look at the score, you have the roadmap, you hear it, you practice, you know all the notes, but not until I think the first after rehearsal. the first performance, <laughs> not just during the rehearsal, but not until mm. after the first performance, do you say, oh, I think I have an idea what the piece is really like now. Right. So... It's, we've had other performances of the piece since then, and it's growing constantly. And that's the sign of a really good piece of music is that it grows and it changes and it changes you too. Um, so uh, again, thank you, Stacy. But honestly, having you there was great. The first time you play a piece, it's a birthing process and we're all jointly giving life to that. And, uh, and it was... Yeah, Oh, I, I was going to ask you, so, now, so, so, along with what Michael just said about giving birth to a piece, now this piece now is um, past toddlerhood and is into adolescence because this had a number of different versions, a number of different performances. Uh, to talk a little bit about the life of Krakatau since, uh, <laughs> since its premiere. Well, what happened is Michael um, asked if maybe I could, I mean, th this piece should have had a functional piano reduction from the beginning and it did not. And Michael was very wise and 
um, actually pursuing a concert version of the piece, uh, which will work not just to help get violists uh, ready to prepare, to prepare them to play it with the orchestra, but now violists can actually play it in concert. So Michael's played it a few times in concert and um, it's a different experience. You know, the piano cannot do glisses. Um, that, that's just all there is to it. But I think uh, I was, you know, it took a while, but I think I found a way to realize that piece for piano in a way that felt convincing to my ear. Who knows, maybe in five years, I'll still disagree with myself and I'll have to make a few more changes, but that's, that's what it is to be a composer. You're, you're, it's like nothing is ever quite fixed. You hope it is, but sometimes you change your mind along the way. The latest development is I was at a, a, a saxophone workshop last week um, it's called the Great Plains Saxophone Workshop. It's with 75 saxophonists that were there in person. It's the first time that many people had gathered together um, since the pandemic in mm -hmm. one area uh, for us. And um, several were actually asking about Krakatoa and saying, we don't have something for saxophone and orchestra from you. We only have saxophone and wind ensemble. So it got me thinking that Theoretically, it's possible to turn the viola part into an alto saxophone. There are some things that are going to be a challenge. Like you heard Michael doing these wonderful cadenzas with the double stops and, and even in the middle of the piece um, between one of the eruptions. Um, so that's going to take some work to try to translate over in a convincing manner. But I think it will really help the saxophone repertoire because I, I just don't have something for that yet. And I think a lot of schools do have concerto competitions. So mm -hmm. this will give a saxophonists something fresh and new to be uh, trying to play with their orchestras. And hopefully it will go out into professional concert halls too. Right. Right. Yeah, I saw a performance of it uh, down in, um, in Shane. Champagne or Banner to do it. Yeah, yeah, wonderful yeah. performance of the piece. And you had already made some changes in it then too. It was wonderful. Well, as you, you know, remember, we I was a, listening through. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, a couple of things. Um, but there was those dastardly um, measures that we finally solved. Um, just do it and, before. <laughs> yeah. And so there's a couple of measures that were just tricky for everybody. And it, it was unnecessarily tricky. And this is one of those things as a composer that you just sometimes don't get your head wrapped around it the first time around or even the second time around. But eventually enough performers come to you and say, hey, what about this or that? It's like, oh, yes, that's the solution. We found it. <laughs> um, and then the, the violist uh, that played it with that orchestra had a couple ideas too, which I think, you know, it's like Michael had um, added his interpretation to it. And I put some of that in the score and Carol had some of her interpretation. And I added that to the score. So I feel like until the moment I sent it to presser and all that, it um, things were in flux. And, Theoretically, they could still be in flex, but it's a little harder sure. once things have gone to a publisher. <laughs> By the way, I love the fact that we're talking, we're, we're here on a program talking about how uh, America celebrates independence. And we're talking about a piece of American music that is like depicting this volcanic eruption all the way on the opposite side of the world from us, for our perspective, um, which, which just goes to, to show that you know american music has throughout its entire history always incorporated elements from other cultures yep and you spoke very uh, clearly earlier about how you purposely pursued the sound and your playing experience with gamelan and infused that into this piece um do you do that also in other pieces of your music not gamelan i don't mean but other cultures have you brought into your pieces and had influence? Yeah, I mean, there's been a number of um, different works. I've, I have a piece that is called Goddess Triptych that will premiere with the mm. St. Louis Orchestra sometime in 2022. Um, that's about three Hindu goddesses. And I um, actually it began with Shiva dances about how cool. Shiva dances the, um, the cosmic dance that breaks apart the universe and starts the next one. So that began it, and I used a little bit of raga ideas in that. Um, but I do actually want more with Greek mythology um, because it's just something that I grew up with. And it feels like for me, that's one of the, it's my comfort zone of storytelling is looking back at, at Greek mythology. Um, but the other side of my personality is to get, um, is to do things with a little bit of a social uh, bent to it. So like I have a piece that's being performed tonight at Ravinia Festival with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra that's called The Battle for the Ballot. And that is about um, women gaining the right to vote. And in, 
Ironically, it's still something very important right now because of what's happening with our voting laws in this country. So I feel like there's a good balance between storytelling and going all in on these uh, either fantastical stories of gods and goddesses or recreating things like a volcano and then having a little bit of a, a social bent to what I do through something like Battle for the Ballot. It, it's so exciting really cool. when you talk about concerts, I have to say, only because we're still kind of in this hazy uh, aspect of opening or not opening right. here in the right. state. And concerts yeah. are still, some are being canceled and some are continuing. So uh, it's so exciting to hear you say that you're having a concert. And well, to me as a musician, I'm like, oh, that's so good to hear. Yeah, yeah. On, on the back side of it, um, the square footage on stage became very important. So um, uh, basically they sent me a map and Baltimore did it too. So I needed two maps from both organizations to see how many musicians could we fit on stage. Mm -hmm. And that is how we determined how many musicians I would orchestrate for. So the Battle for the Ballot is actually for four orchestra and I wrote the chamber, I brought it down to a chamber group based on the square footage. Okay. Ravinia is an outdoor venue. So there's a lot of fresh air blowing through um, and I don't know what they're doing with spacing people out in the audience, I'll find out tonight. Mask mandates are coming down in Illinois. So um, there, there, it could be that people will be a little more tightly packed than I originally thought. But yeah, it's definitely a weird experience to finally start going out and being around people and feeling like, I, I think I still need a little bit of a personal bubble to feel comfortable being out and about. Mm -hmm. Do you guys feel the same way? Well, I mean, at the very beginning of August uh, will be the first time I will be performing live in a year and a half. Uh, we, and Michael and I together will be up at the um, a Baroque music festival on a little island in the middle of Lake Michigan. The 21st season of this, or 20th season, I guess, of this, of this festival. And every single performer, every singer, every player, conductors, the board have agreed they will be vaccinated before the before the the concerts. That's that's them going all in, you know, to to creating a safe environment. And then uh, we're taking measures for ventilation and that kind of thing. But yeah, it's uh, it is this thing starting to starting to open up, and this will be a big step to uh, to actually be able to perform live. Uh, now that is a smaller orchestra, so there is a little bit of elbow room on stage already, but still, still all of those things have been, and we have plan B, C, D, E, F, M, Q, R, and Z, uh, if we have to make fast, fast changes at the end. Yeah, there was an unbelievable amount of things happening with different groups that was like, they were saying, we're going to do this. Nope, we're going to need to do this. We're going to need to do that. So I've seen uh, plans change so much. And it makes sense. Everybody's trying to remain flexible and considerate mm -hmm. of people around them. Um, I think this is also why we're not seeing seasons roll out quite yet for a lot of groups. Some have sure. announced uh, what they're doing for all of, of next year. Some are only announcing the fall. Um, with spring to be announced later on, depending on what's happening with the Delta variant. So it's a very, as frustrating as this time is, I think it's also a time of great creativity and we're, we're seeing so much that we never would have dreamt to do together. And that's where I found a lot of, um, a, a lot of hope during this time period is mm -hmm. being able to collaborate people with people over Zoom or Skype in ways that we wouldn't have dreamed of a year and a half ago. And that all of uh, many of the skills, many of the technology, many of the techniques, many of the approaches that we have learned in this last 18 months are not going to go away. A lot of that are going to be brought forward permanently into the world of, of, of uh, performing and arts. And this is great. This is, this is a whole toolbox of things that need to be added uh, that, that, can, that I think can really help expand our yes. world. You know? Very much so. Like why there's orchestras that had not played outside their region before and suddenly we can watch concerts of their what they're doing around the world. And same with opera companies. It's been yep. very, very educational and exciting to hear what's happening literally around the country and the world. So I do hope that when we're past this time period, that not all these aspects just fade away, that we can stay this connected as well as be able to celebrate together in person. Bravo, bravo. Yeah. Um, just a heads up, we are going to aim for about a 
couple more minutes and then move on to the next piece of music. But before we move on to the next piece of music that's going to be played, I want to ask Michael a very interesting topic that I know he loves to talk about. He's sitting there hugging his viola. Michael, please tell everyone about your instrument. <laughs> oh, gosh. So um, any of you in, in the audience listening who have ever played an instrument, you understand you develop a relationship with that instrument um, because of just you're growing up together. Basically, this becomes almost like a journal instead of a journal about yourself every day. You are physically engaging, uh, it touches your body. body awareness, learning about your own vulnerabilities and strengths through this. You learn new levels of humbleness. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, because viola, from anybody that does not know, is part of the violin family. It's just a larger violin, basically. Um, so it, the laws of physics, the larger an instrument, the lower sound it will have. So this instrument has been around for hundreds of years from Italy. And, you know, I, I do own it, but really this instrument will probably be in the hands of another player, hopefully after I play it and another and another for centuries further. So it's almost like I'm more of a steward taking care of this uh, jewel until it's passed into someone else's hopefully loving and capable hands. They are just like children, quite honestly. This instrument does not like to get too cold or too hot. It never wants to get wet, actually. I guess children like to get wet, but <laughs> it's very temperamental. So I honestly don't know what it's going to sound like every day I open the case until I pull my bow across for the first note because it's wood. So that means it absorbs humidity, it releases humidity, and it also uh, recognizes the changes in temperature every day. So honestly, sometimes it sounds like it's a beautiful, uh, a, a woman's beautiful voice. Other days it will sound like a very tight man who has chain smoked to his whole life. <laughs> And those are the days that I cry. We cry together, uh, the viola and I. And then there are days that it just sounds like I'm standing on top of a mountain in the Himalayas and I will play a note and it sounds like it resonates throughout the entire universe. And my body is just doing this with it. Um, and it, it's really, we're, it's a symbiotic relationship. As I'm playing the instrument, it's vibrating, giving me back feedback constantly. Very much like when you all drive your cars, you can tell when the car maybe starts to slip in the rain or a motorbike, or if, if it's not responding well and the engine's having some trouble, or there are just days you get in the car and you just zoom through the countryside without traffic. Um, and, you know, the beauty of it is that it teaches me how to, because of its unpredictability, it teaches me how to be flexible and try to work with the tools that I have at the moment. So there's a lot to be learned uh, by studying an instrument. It's not just an occupation. It doesn't have to even be an occupation, but it's a vehicle for expression, self-awareness, collaboration with other humans, learning pace, uh, understanding that you yourself are but one person in this long arc of history and hu of humanity, and uh, not just the arts, but in society. So the viola opens up the world <laughs> for me. Thank you for asking, Irene. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. So. We're wrapping up the end of this discussion for all of you who are tuning in. And thank you, Michael and Robert and Stacy, for um, an eye-opening conversation, really um, in depth about music, about orchestra, about the piece Krakatoa composing. The next piece we're going to listen to is Hoedown. It's by another American composer, Aaron Copeland. And for the audience, you'll notice that it's slightly different, just slightly <laughs> different from Krakatoa. So please enjoy Hoedown. Thank you. 
slowdown is always fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you, if you would have noticed, this is a completely different room from the uh, previous video. Also, this was at uh, a performance at the Dago Tea House. If some some of you might be familiar with Dago in Bandung, a very famous area in Bandung, um, Krakatoa was at the Hilton Bandung in Pasir Paliki area. So, completely different area. By the way, there's now a new concert hall. Actually, it's probably the only proper concert hall in Bandung. It's in Unpar Universitas Parahyangan. So looking forward to all of the uh, live performances that will happening be happening there after this is oh, over. Yes, please. Yes, please. I saw pictures of it. It looks magnificent. <laughs> yes, yes. Super excited. <laughs> so the next uh, three videos that will be played back to back is very much from uh, current times. It was taken on Monday, <laughs> talking about a uh, pandemic and all that stuff. Uh, one of the players that was supposed to do the recording actually got tested positive a day before the recording. So we had to do some really fast plan B, C, D, E's there. <laughs> um, but yeah, but I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm very excited to, to have you all listen to this. It's Andika Chandra on the flute, Chandra Kasmoyo on the violin, Angelia Sandililingan on the cello, and they will be performing Yankee Doodle, Old Man River, and the Star Spangled Banner. Please enjoy. The next one is an arrangement of Old Man River. I think. <laughs> All right, so while we're waiting for um, 
little Alexi, I suppose, to prepare old man. Ah, there it is. Perfect.
Andika Chandra, Chandra Kasmoyo, and Angelia Sandeliringan. All of that was arranged by Chen Chen. So we've come to the, almost to the closing of tonight's wonderful program. I'd like to ask maybe Stacey or Robert or Michael, do you have any closing comments? I would just- no. Please oh, go ahead, Stacey. I would just love to say it was such a remarkable experience visiting your country and getting that opportunity to work with the Bandung Philharmonic. It, I loved meeting everybody there and working with the musicians. So thank you. Thank you for your hospitality. And I always will have fond memories of that trip. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much uh, to At America for hosting this event. Uh, just absolutely thrilled that you have helped uh, shed light on uh, what Irene and the entire city of Bandung is doing with the orchestra. So, and, uh, and combining it with the celebration of American music as well. Thank you. Um, I want to give a gift of a recommendation, unsolicited recommendation. If everybody liked the music they just heard, I recommend listening to a piece that's very closely related. Uh, living American composer Jesse Montgomery has a piece that she based off of the Star Spangled Banner loosely. You can hear it there, but it's wonderful to listen to. And it's titled Banner. So Jesse Montgomery Banner. It's a, it's a wonderful piece of music and it'll lift your spirits and energies. Uh, but thank you to everybody at, at America and Irene for hosting. And thank you, Stacy and Robert for giving me the opportunity to help share that, that concerto with the audience, well, the world. So thank you. I'm actually doing it again this uh, late September. 
So, and there's plans for more coming up too. Yeah, I'll just add my thanks as well, Irene, um, that the Bandung Phil has been committed to continuing activities through these last 18 months in creative ways that chamber music and, and, and these kind of conversations. Brava. Uh, and Stacy and Michael for bringing this piece uh, to life. Um, it was a great, a great honor and a great pleasure to do that. Uh, what's the next thing we're going to do together? Come on, let's, let, let's do another thing. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for waking up so early and for joining us in this event. So uh, with that, I am going to hand it over to you, Jasmine. Thank you so much, um, Irene, for being our moderator for this evening and also for our wonderful speakers, uh, Miss Stacy, Mr. Michael, and also Mr. Robert for joining us. So earlier in the event, I asked you guys a social media question. And the question was, in what year did the Star Spangled Banner officially became the US national anthem? So in what year was it? It was in 1931. So our winner uh, for this evening is from Facebook, IW. Congrats, you answered correctly. Now, for those of you who would like to participate in our social media quiz next time, you can tune in from the beginning of the event because that's when we'll be sharing our question. Now, earlier in the event, I also shared with you that Ad America is having a giveaway as part of our 10th anniversary celebration and also celebrating 4th of July. We're inviting you to participate so you don't miss out on a chance to receive a content creator package. Now, for more information, you guys can go to the link at atam.tv slash free to be us for more information to join. Now, for those of you who are wondering, how can you develop an awesome idea at an awesome place like Ad America? It's really easy. You can just go to our website at www.adamerica.org.id, select create a program and go to collaborate with us. All proposals coming to us will be reviewed and your event might be featured here soon. And while you guys are on our website, don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter so you guys get updates sent straight to your inbox. We won't spam you, we promise, just once a week. And also don't forget to follow us on our social media for fun content, event updates, and many more. I hope you have a good evening and see you at the next Ad America TV event. Bye-bye, everybody.